So we're, go we're going to talk about the message. We we've laid the groundwork uh, for all this in our first talk, and you'll see some of those being amplified in what we're going to say just now. But this is really uh, all about what is the message that we take. So our, our first talk was about how we are commissioned by Jesus to go out, to give life, eternal life, to those who are in need, to seek and to save those who are lost. This is about, okay, so what is the message then? What am I taking? How do I do that? If I was to give you a microphone today, right now, this microphone, and I'll say, right, tell me, what is the gospel? What would you say? Right now, right? We need to be able to, to do that. To, it needs to be something intrinsic in us. We need to be able to express that both in action and in word and in how we're listening. We need to be instilled with the message and the gospel so that it can mean something to us and so that we can give it to people with passion, with meaning, from our own lived experience so it has the power that it should have. If, if you know, That's where it is. That's what we're going to try and explore. So we're going to start, uh, we're going to start where we were sort of briefly in Luke chapter 10 and uh, we were going to, we were talking about how Jesus sent out 70 and he sent them out without purse, without bag, without pair of sandals to seek and to save, to give the message, the good news of the kingdom of God. And here they are coming back uh, now to Jesus, verse 17. And they're coming back rejoicing. The, the 70 returned with joy. They were fired. They were passionate. They were amazed. Lord, they said, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. I've given you authority. Trample on snakes and scorpions. Overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. And Jesus was full of joy through the Holy Spirit. Demons. They'd been out fighting demons. Rescuing people from, from demonic possession. So this whole idea of demons is bound up with the idea of madness. Bound up with the idea of darkness, torment. Self-harm, dying and death. And the scripture gives this to us as the natural state of man. In darkness, in madness. And in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, they submit to us. That's the background to this story of disciples coming back to Jesus. Come quickly with me to Ephesians. Ephesians 2, so we can truly understand what this is all about. It's just an example. We'll come back to Ephesians later. Ephesians 2, 2. We will come back here probably. You were dead in the transgressions and sins you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. That's what we're talking about, the ways of this world the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. It's that spirit, that stoichia that we talked about earlier, the darkness, the deceptive ideology, the madness. That's how he used to be, he said. That's what we are fighting. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that. And he could see that darkness all around him in the lives of the people that he met, in his society, in his culture, right to the very highest levels of society, he could see that. And he struggled and fought against that. That's why he said in verse 18, I saw Satan like lightning fall from heaven. He could see then. He could sense victory in this battle. He could see it. Come quickly to Revelation 20. Of course, this is picked up there. Revelation 20. I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having a great chain. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, the devil and Satan. Evil is bound for a thousand years when Jesus comes back. He threw him into an abyss. Brothers and sisters, there's so much evil in this world, in one man in particular. 
so much evil, so much darkness. The time will come, the time will come when Jesus will bind him and throw him into a pit of oblivion. And Jesus rejoiced to see that, and we should too. That victory is coming, and it will be here. And everything that you're seeing will disappear when Jesus comes. There will be no more tears. So he saw that. He sensed that. And he rejoiced in it. Back to Luke 10. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I saw it. And that time will come. I've given you, he said, I've given you authority. I gave you that. To trample on snakes and scorpions. Well, there you are. Sunday school days. Genesis 3.15. Surely that's where we are. Trampling on snakes, right? It's here, right from the beginning. Genesis 3.15. Right at the dawn of time. The promise that as they struggled, Adam and Eve, in the depths of this terrible story, cursed forever, here is a light in the darkness. There will be a Messiah. There will be one who will come. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. There will be this struggle. There will be this battle of good against evil. But your offspring will crush your, your head. His your offspring will crush his head and you will crush his heel. You will do that. And that's what this language in Luke 10 is based on, isn't it? To trample on snakes, to, to crush the, the head of the snake. This is actually, uh, just for interest, I think enshrined in the ancient zodiac. So you know Orion, the picture of Orion. He's actually struggling, he's wrestling with a serpent. And under his feet is Scorpio, the scorpion. Uh, that's really interesting, I found that when I learned that when I was your age. Right? So it's a battle against evil, right? That's what the Messiah has come to do. He's come to battle and struggle against evil and against the darkness, and he will win. He will win. Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2 is the struggle of our Lord and our Messiah against the evil within and without, in his own experience. He struggled and struggled and suffered to the last drop of blood for you and me. Hebrews chapter 2. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. He shared in their humanity. He lived that darkness. He lived that experience, not just in his own life, but in the life of all those that he met and who came to him. He lived that so that by his death, by his death finally on the cross, to the last he loved, to the last. He would destroy the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. So freedom then, freedom then is the gospel message. To be free from the darkness, to be free from the struggle, to come to the light, to be loved and to have a hope and a future. That is what the Messiah came to bring to us. That's the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as he came out of the tomb. That's the power of his resurrection. It's a clear demonstration. Evil is conquered. Life from the death is possible now through Jesus. And that's the message that he said, I've, I've given you, he said, authority. I've given you that message. I've taken it out there. 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. Tell them. Tell them. Jesus is alive. Tell them there is another way. There's a better way. There's a, there is a hope. Tell them. 2 Corinthians 5, 20. He's committed to us, verse 19. He's committed to us, to you and to me. Yes, little you, little me. 
the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Christ's ambassadors, as though God is making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's the message. That's the message. Be reconciled to God. There is a way. That's what we have to take out of there. But we have to take it, as Jesus did, and as the apostles did, out of our own experience, out of our own struggle. We have to preach this message from our own weakness, from our own experience of struggle against evil. We have to preach, as I said earlier, from that weakness to that weakness. Ephesians 6. Suffering is a fundamental part of being a Christian, following Jesus. It's granted to us to suffer so that we should learn, so that we should learn how to fight evil, how the good fights evil. Ephesians 6 verse 10, be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes, against the deceptions within you and without for your struggle. For your struggle. I sound like an old man now. <laughs> yeah, you are young, you know. I was young once. We are all young once. Your struggle, you know, it, it is a struggle, brothers and sisters. It is a struggle. Struggle is not against flesh and blood. Not at all. It's against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world. It's against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, exactly what we've been talking about. Paul said he fought with beasts at Ephesus. He certainly did. Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. There are days of evil that will come to you and have come to all of us. In that day, you may be able to stand, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand. With your feet fitted with a readiness from the gospel of peace with a shield of faith and you know it well you know it well so that's your fight that's your struggle that's your experience and through that you will be you'll be strong and you will learn you will learn what Jesus gave to his uh, disciples the authority how to love to love and to totally depend on God only God with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind and to love your neighbour as yourself. Romans 12, 21. How do you fight the evil? How do you do that in your life? And how do you do that in their life? How do you do that? Romans 12, 21. Do not overcome. Do not be overcome by the evil. But overcome evil with good with love, with purity, with truth from your heart. So I'm looking at a few passages up here. John 1, John 1, 5. And because it's Jesus, right? Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light that came into the world. John 1, 5. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God in the beginning. You know, this is, this is Genesis, isn't it? This is Genesis. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. That's the natural state of man. There it is, right in front of you. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And John says, that light is the life of men. To love most powerful force 
in your life. And that light, he says in verse 5, shines in the darkness. And it says, importantly, the darkness could not overcome it. It could not overcome it. You switch a light on in any dark room. The light wins every time. Every time. Evil cannot stand in the face of good. It cannot. And that's what we see here in Jesus. The darkness could not overcome it. And that was Jesus. And so that's what people's experience was when they met our Lord. Right? So think of Peter, the Apostle Peter, right? So he's a fisherman. I guess his life wasn't too great. And he meets Jesus. What does he do? He drops to his knees. Lord, depart from me. I am a sinful man. So in face of the good, in the face of the light, he realizes the darkness. He sees now the darkness in his life. And he, he can't face it. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. I cannot stand in the presence of your holiness. He got it. That's the gospel. He was now in that place where we all need to be in understanding that truth. That is the truth. The darkness is in you. And once you know that, then you can be saved. Then you can reach out to Jesus and be saved. So then, as a preacher, as a preacher, you need to be that light in the world, in your own self. You need to be able to show that light of Jesus, really, not just and only through the words that you can give from the Bible. You have to be genuinely, from your heart, transparently, that loving, holy person that will open up for them the understanding that there is a way and it's in, you can see something in you that is a spark of light that will lead them to Jesus. And that's not just by words or quotations from the Bible, though that might help. So these are real people, right? These are real people we're talking to. And you're standing there on the street and it could be anybody, right? You could turn around and there's a man with a dog asking you, what about the Crusades? There's a girl. She's gay. What does the Bible say about homosexuality? She reaches up and gives you a hug as you pray for her. And she's gone. She comes. A lady. She just made it out today. She's so depressed. She just wants some care. They're all around. These people. They're real people who we're talking about, they're lost, that you have to try to reach with the light of Jesus. So we need them. That's why holiness is so important. And we look at that, I think, in a third talk. Holiness is so important for believers. Your own life needs to reflect that. You need to reflect that Lord's glory. You need to be changed yourself into the image of Jesus. You need to have experienced that in your own life to be able to communicate that to others. And all believers then are preachers. We are all preachers. You don't have to have a comprehensive Bible knowledge. You know, there's not many people today that will come to you and argue about the Trinity. Not many. There are some. Most of them will be people in desperate need, looking for love and looking for truth and looking for meaning. You can all, we can all do that. We can all do that from our heart. So come with me to Isaiah then. So we want to explore what that looks like in the lives of real people. How does this evil then work its way out in uh, their lives and ours? And how can we address that? How can we reach out with the love of God and the word of God into that experience? How can we do that? Well, Jesus is the answer as usual. Isaiah 52, 42, 7. It's a prophecy about the Messiah and he's a servant, right? He's a servant, a suffering servant. That's you, right? 
suffering servant. I, the Lord, have called you, verse 6, in righteousness. I'll take hold of your hand. I'll keep, hold, keep you. I'll make you a covenant for the people. I'm going to make you a light, a light for the Gentiles. You're going to open eyes that are blind. You're going to free captives from prison to release then from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. This is the key words uh, that we're going to be picking up on because we're going to go over to Isaiah 61 that we read together to understand the mission of the Messiah, to understand uh, how the Lord preached in this way and then to learn from that as to how we can fight the darkness and save the lost. Isaiah 61 It starts with the spirit of the sovereign Lord, the spirit of God, right? The Lord has anointed him. The Lord has anointed him with the spirit of God. This comes from God. This comes from God, the God of glory, the God of love. And you know it well, but we could just flick back to his Exodus, Exodus 34. And we hinted at this in our first talk. Exodus 34. Moses says to God, Show me your glory. Show me your glory. Exodus 33, verse 18, and we spoke about this before. To see God's glory, to see who God is. This is what he wanted to do. And so what was the answer? Exodus 34, verse 6. Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. It starts with, I am. It starts with, there is a God. You can't, pre you can't preach to anyone until they've passed that milestone. The first milestone then is, Yahweh, there is a God, I am. Accept that first. That's the starting point. Compassion. That's amazing. First thing, the first thing that Moses hears about God, compassion. He's a God of compassion. What is that? Compassion. It means to, to have a, a common sense of passion, to, to experience, to come alongside someone and to share their passion, their, their um, ex experience, and to share their suffering. That's what it means to be compassionate with somebody. It's that thing that happens when you know, a little boy falls over and breaks his knee. Uh, his knee, you know, your heart just goes, oh, and it comes from here. That's compassion. That's what your God is. That's your God. That's what the Lord showed. That's how he preached, through compassion. And then there's love. Love. God is love, said John. But although he is forgiving, and he maintains love to thousands for sure, the second part of this is always forgotten. He is also a God of truth. He is also a God of justice and truth. He is not so forgiving that he is tolerant of everything. Love is not tolerance. It doesn't mean that you go out there and do what you like because God is so loving he will forgive you. Be careful. Your God is a consuming fire. He will have justice. He will not leave the guilty unpunished. You are accountable for everything you do and one day you will stand in front of Jesus and be accountable for everything you do. He knows, he sees. So remember that about God too. He knows your thoughts, as we said earlier. He's inside you. Remember that. So there are two sides to God then. Grace and truth. And it changes us. It changes us when we experience that. Come to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 3. As it changed the lives of all those who Jesus met. All of them. Peter, James, John, Mary, Magdalene. She was so changed by Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. It's, it's using the story that we were just in on, uh, with Moses and the Exodus. And it says that's, that's how we are. So as Moses was on the mountain, 
seeing the glory of God. So we are here contemplating Jesus. Verse 17, the Lord's spirit. And this is what we are just talking about in Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord. Where the spirit of the Lord is, if you really understood that, who your God is and what he is, then you will be free. There is freedom. And we, with unveiled faces, reflect that Lord's glory. Like Moses, his face was radiant, right? That's right. We are being changed by that, by that love. It will change you. You have never experienced love like that from the Lord. And you will one day. We are being changed by that into his likeness into his likeness. So we are going to be reflecting more and more that compassion, that love, that uh, truth with ever increasing glory. And where does it come from? It comes from the Lord. From the Lord. Through the scriptures for sure, but through our experience too, who is the Spirit. And over the page, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, there it is again. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. There we are again, back at the creation. God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Let his light shine in our hearts. To give us the light of what? Of the knowledge of the glory of God. To really know God. Where is that? Where is that? How do I get that? In the face of Christ. That's where you get it, in the face of Jesus. Whatever that means to you and to me, that's where it is. And one day you will know that for real. So that's the light and the darkness. Come back to Isaiah 61. So then, anointed with that, filled with that from the God, through Jesus, through you to them, we can now understand how this works and how it worked for Jesus. Isaiah 61. The spirit of the, of the Lord was on me. The Lord anointed me. It came into me, said the, this is the Messiah we're talking about, into him to, to preach, to preach. Who was that message for then? Read this chapter. Who was that message for? It was for the poor. It was for the brokenhearted. It was for the captives. It was to those who sit in darkness. That's who your message is for. That's the people God is sending you to save and to free. And Jesus sought those people out. He went to find a Samaritan woman. Countless people, I'm sure, privately, he went to find to rescue them. The poor and the despised of this world. That's who his message was. The poor then, those who have nothing. Those who have nothing. Even though perhaps they don't realize it. Even though they think they're rich. They're poor. Jesus has riches far, far greater than anything this world could offer. So that's the treasures. That's the treasures that we have, can give to those who are willing to hear a real life, to really live that Zoe life, that life of love, the riches of God's grace, forgiveness. What a glorious inheritance we have. He sent me to bind up the broken hearted. To bind up the broken hearted. Click back a few pages, Isaiah 30, 26. moon will shine like the sun the sunlight be seven times brighter like the light of seven full days there's the light shining so brightly when the Lord binds up the bruises of his people and heals the wounds he inflicted Psalm 147 says the same the Lord heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds so we are back then to the Good Samaritan surely we are back then to Binding up, pouring in the oil and the wine, bandaging them, 
putting them on our own donkey and taking them. Taking them to a place of safety and sanctuary at our own expense. So, they're out there, lost, broken. They, found, they thought they found love, but they lost it, maybe. Their families are broken. They are abused beyond what you and I could ever imagine. They are broken. Perhaps they turn to addiction to hide that. So compassion then is what we need. We can't walk by. We need to feel that compassion. And they walk amongst us, brothers and sisters, bind them up. They are broken hearted. The Lord is close, Psalm 34. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. That's your mission. Maybe he sent you to do just that. He sent us to proclaim freedom for the captives. Jesus proclaimed freedom for the captives. What can this mean? Well, many things, I guess. I, I once questioned after preaching for many times. How can we preach a gospel of repentance? What's right and wrong to this generation when nobody is allowed to tell anyone what they're doing is wrong? How can we preach that, a gospel of repentance, when that seems to have gone? I was thinking about that. I think I was in Shrewsbury, yes. God brought me three people who were, who were bound with guilt in their life, captive to guilt. I was billing, actually. She had such a conscience about what she'd done. She had a house full of Bibles, but she couldn't come to the Lord. And I met a man who came to me with a piece of paper in his hand, and he said, read this. He'd been in a graveyard writing passages from the Bible about God's judgment. He said, is this going to happen to me? Because of what I've done. I met a prisoner, ex-prisoner on a bench, thinking about what he'd done and his past. People are out there, bound with guilt. They are. Conscience really is there in everyone. It is true. People are bound in guilt. I realized and I learned. And so we can free them. We can free them as I did each one of these. To tell them, it's not your life. It's Jesus' life that will save you. Just believe. That's the message. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. But there is another slavery. There is another kind of slavery. 2 Peter 2. Two Peter 2 verse 18. They mouth empty boastful words. Just open up Twitter any day. They mouth boastful empty words. They appeal to the lustful desires of the sinful human nature. Indeed they do. They entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom. You can be free. Be what you like. You are free. While they themselves are slaves of depravity. They're slaves of depravity. For a man is a slave of whatever has mastered him. That's the truth. And they want to bind you into that same slavery. To your lusts and to your passions. And you will not be able to escape not without Jesus. And you will know that while it's happening. And you will, you will not know how to escape. But Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, hold on to Jesus, then you will know the truth. The truth that the darkness is in you. God is good. God is light. That's the truth. Know that. And the, and the truth will set you free. John 18. Happiness is not in the worship of yourself. It's not in the selfies. Not at all. It's not about you, actually. It's about God, and it's about them. That's it. 
That's the truth that will set you free. And you're going to release from darkness the prisoners or those who sit in darkness. I have to approach this topic with great sensitivity. Mental illness is a really difficult, dark place to be. Anxiety, depression are deep and dark and dangerous places to be. And we have to be very sensitive in talking about this and dealing with it. It's based on fear. And I'm saying that from my own experience. It's based on fear. And we have to learn to fly. We have to learn to let go and trust in God. Everything is in his hands. And he loves us. You have to learn to fly and let go. That's the way out. That's the way of light out of that darkness somehow and God will teach you that and he taught me that but it's hard really hard really hard so you have to let go Proverbs 3 is my favorite I have to repeat this you know we need these fighter verses you know remember them they're brilliant remember them these fight I've got this one on my desk in a frame Actually, in fact, I'll tell you, Matthew, I'll tell you. When I was baptized at rugby, granddad gave me a Bible. And inside my grandma's hand was written this verse. I was quite offended at the time. I now know what it means. Proverbs 3, um, 24. I now know what it means. Um... Verse, uh, verse six, trust, verse five, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That's the bit I got wrong out there, right? Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. It says here, acknowledge him. I say surrender to him and he will make your paths straight. Give it to God, let go and he will do it for you. And if you need another, another verse, uh, for depression, difficulty, come with me to Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3. Verse 22. His compassions, as we've been talking about, never fail. They are new every morning. They are indeed. The Lord is good to those who hope in him who seeks him, verse 26, it's good to wait patiently for the salvation of the Lord. This is what spoke to me. It's good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid on him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. Wait for the Lord. He will do it. He loves you. Trust him. So, back to Isaiah then, to the message. So that's what we have to do, to go out there and to show people these powerful messages of love and of hope and of redemption in Jesus. And then we have to proclaim, to proclaim, it says, verse 2. Two things, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, and, this is where Jesus stopped, didn't he? The day of vengeance for our God. It's the same day, right? It's the same day that's coming. But for you as a believer, it's the day, the day of the Lord's favor. He's coming for you. And you should look up, Jesus said. He's coming back for you. But for those who don't, it's a day of vengeance, a day of wrath that is coming to this world. And there will be a new world with a new heavens and a new earth that is coming into this world. And it's our responsibility to preach that and to show people about that, that it's coming. I'm looking anxiously at my clock here because I, want, I just want to take you to Romans. Just forgive me. I, I want to take you to Romans uh, to show you.
This is an exposition of the gospel, right? So if I'd given you this microphone at the beginning, right, this is where you should have, in your, in your intellectual mind, should have come, right, straight here. Romans 1, this is the thesis. This is Apostle Paul's thesis on the answer to that question, what is the gospel, and it's here. And he summarizes it for you nicely in, in, in Romans 1, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God. That's what it is. It's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, for the Jew and the Gentile, because in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. That's Jesus. A right way, a true way, a holy way, a better way. It's in Jesus. A righteousness that's by faith. You can't see, you have to believe from first to last, the righteous will live, that will live by faith. That's the message. And then he goes on to expound this gospel in intimate detail from chapter 1 through to chapter 8. And it's, it's a, spend time in it. It's, it's, it's magnificent. But how does it start, right? How would you start preaching the gospel? How do we start preaching the gospel? You're not like this. Verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. When have you heard anybody preach the gospel to you starting that way? The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven, you know? So we used to do that. You know, the Bible thumpers, you know, used to bang the table and tell you the wrath of God will be revealed from heaven. That's how the Apostle Paul starts his gospel. Why don't we do that? Maybe it's because we don't believe in hell, right? We need to get this clear. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against the godlessness and evil that's all around. God is angry. God is furious. And you need to know that if you're part of that. The problem is then uh, in our society that that truth that is being given is suppressed then. That truth that the darkness is inside you is suppressed by their wickedness. And they should know, it says, what's been known of God is plain to them. God is, God is made it plain, right? We all know. When we see beauty, when we hear music, we know what's good and evil. We know that love is the ultimate force in our life, to be loved and to love. We know that because we are made in the image of God, right? That's what's resonating. We know it. But instead of that, and you stood out doubt, he says, the eternal power and God's quality has been clearly seen. Instead of that, they knew it. Verse 21, but they did not do two things. What two things? They didn't glorify him as God, and they didn't give thanks to him. But their foolish hearts became darkened. They went into the darkness. They turned from the light to the darkness because uh, they uh, loved that. And they changed the glory of God, these beautiful things, into images. Right, images. Selfie, right? I can change that with a digital thing, get so many likes. Right, it's what they did, right? They changed that into images. Mortal men, birds, and worship that instead. They worship myself. It's myself that I'm worshipping. And that's exactly the opposite of what the gospel really is. So we can't have a detailed exposition of Romans, Jeremy, so... I'm sorry, but I'd love to, because here, for example, are three things that are exchanged here. The glory of the immortal God for images, verse 23. The truth of God for a lie in verse 25. The natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. Three things they exchanged. How interesting. And three things then that God gave them up to. He gave them up to sexual impurity. He gave them up to shameful lusts. And he gave them up to what? A depraved mind. And they were trapped by that. There's much more we could say. So, quickly then, we find that we ended up in Romans 3. So we've gone right from the darkness. We've realized the darkness. That's where the starting point is for every conversion, to realize the darkness. And then you can get to the place in verse 3 where you realize, chapter 3, where you realize, verse 11, there is no one. There is no one who understands. And the apostle puts 10, 10 quotations from the Old Testament here. Bang, 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 until you are absolutely on your knees. There is no one. No one, not one, that is righteous. Now you can understand. Now you can understand verse 21. But now. Look out for the but nows in the Bible. It's beautiful. But now a righteousness from God has been revealed. The lights have been switched on. The Lord is coming. This righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And so from chapter 3, we start to rise 
through chapter 3, through into the light, until you come eventually to chapter 8, the pinnacle now. So we've gone from wrath to, to, to on our knees, and now we are soaring in Romans 8 in love. We are washed with love in Romans 8, a wash with love in all these things. Romans 8, verse 37, we are more than conquerors. There's that struggle. We are more than conquerors. Why? Because he loves us. Because he loves us, I'm convinced. Neither death, nor life, angels, nor those demons. Neither the present, nor the future, nor anything. Height, depth, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. There you are. That's the gospel. And he's coming. He's coming back. Romans 8. I consider verse 18. Our present sufferings are not worth comparing with that glory. It's going to be revealed. Everything that we've just spoken of will become real, actually real in the world that we're going to see. The creation waits for it in eager expectation for the sons and daughters of God for to be revealed. And that's our third talk. Mm-hmm.